first of all, we really, really focus on supporting our docs and our APPs. That's one of our core values. That is wellness. Welcome to the License to Lead podcast. I'm Patty Fay. This podcast is for physicians or anyone who thinks healthcare needs a transformation led by physicians. License to lead means that physicians are charged with and must be in charge of guiding the vision and the culture of healthcare systems. Hi, everyone. This is Patty Fay. A year ago, the CEO of a remarkably successful emergency medicine organization left us with a cliffhanger right here on this podcast. Dr. Christopher Obitz, who goes by the first name Topher, described how his organization, Emergency Care Consultants, was facing multiple crises. He wasn't sure if the organization would survive or if it did, whether the values that had been unswerving for 30 years would survive. Those values had created a superb culture, excellent patient care, and almost no physician turnover in a field that was defined by burnout and high turnover. At the end of the podcast last year, I asked if he would be willing to come back in about a year and give us an update. I wanted to know if his physician-owned and physician-led organization with its strong commitment to patients and physicians would be able to muster through. So he's here today to give us that follow-up. In the course of this conversation, we talk about Alfie Cohn, who was my guest on the 35th episode of License to Lead. Topher and I ponder some questions about incentives, and you'll hear me mention that I would reach out to Alfie Cohn to see if he could help us resolve those questions. I did, and he did. I will close that loop at the very end of this podcast. Here's CEO and President of Emergency Care Consultants, Dr. Christopher Obitz. Dr. Obitz, welcome back to the podcast. Patty, how are you? So happy to be back. I'm so glad to have you back. I really appreciate the chance to talk with you again. So when we talked a year ago, there were three big crises going on and you were concerned that maybe the values of the organization or perhaps the organization wouldn't necessarily survive. So how are things going? Well, first of all, thank you for asking. You're exactly right. One year ago, we as an emergency medicine group were facing so many challenges. And some of these challenges were ones you could never even dream up or imagine. First of all, with the pandemic, never would we imagine that a pandemic could threaten the livelihood of an ER group. We expected the opposite. We suspected that if a pandemic hit, we would be overrun with patients and the amount of work required of us would be abundant and it would, although a challenge, it would be a, a growth opportunity for us as an organization. What happened, of course, was, and not just in our emergency departments, but really nationwide and worldwide, the patient volumes plummeted during the first several months of the pandemic. We had about a 40 to 50% drop in emergency department volumes. And the reason behind that is we certainly we were taking care of quite a few very sick COVID patients. But with lockdowns and with the fears from the general public that they would catch COVID in an ER or in a hospital, they stopped coming. And how did that affect us? Well, we live and die by uh, patients coming to our emergency department as a business. If, if there are no patients, we still have to pay our staff. We still have to pay the bills and keep the lights on. And so that was a major challenge. To get through that, we rolled up our sleeves collectively. We shortened our shifts. We closed down certain shifts in emergency departments, and we just held our breath. And what happened was after five, six months of this, they started trickling back. And slowly but surely, the, the patient volume started to normalize. That was a, a sigh of relief uh, for us as a business, but it was also really important for the community because a lot of healthcare had been neglected during that time. One of the things we found was that the patients who had been away oftentimes had issues that uh, had they been attended to earlier, they could have had better outcomes. So we saw not only increased volume, but we saw an increase in morbidity and mortality. So obviously that was very sad for a lot of people. It's just another of the effects that COVID has had on the health of America, even for those who didn't individually suffer from the actual infection. About that same time, uh, specifically on December 31st of 2020, 
one of our 10 hospitals was shut down. It was really a safety net hospital in downtown St. Paul. And essentially it was financially, it was under very dire circumstances. And it was really the only viable option to keep things afloat financially for that healthcare system. It was tough on the patients. A lot of the patients, you know, as I mentioned, really were safety net patients who didn't have a lot of other resources for care. And so what happened is they started going to other emergency departments throughout the East Metro area of the Twin Cities. Our group happens to staff a lot of those hospitals. And the fallout from that is that most of our emergency departments in the East Metro now are really struggling because there are too many patients. We're booming with patients. Not only the ED patient volumes are going up, but the hospital beds are full. And so what we're facing there is the worst boarding crisis uh, of medical patients that we've ever seen before. A boarding crisis? So boarding means any emergency department patient who needs to be admitted to the hospital, if there's no bed available in that hospital or at another hospital to which they can be transferred, they stay in the emergency department, taking up a bed and they're boarding until a resource becomes available. There are varying definitions, but it's somebody who's generally going to be in the ED for many hours after a bed has uh, been requested. But believe it or not, here and in other places in the country, patients can be regularly boarded for 24 hours, 48 hours, sometimes 72 hours. And sometimes these are not patients just going to the regular floor. Sometimes they're intubated patients needing to go to the ICU. And there's all sorts of downstream effects. First of all, it's not uncommon to walk into your shift in the ED these days. And let's say there are 30 beds that we have in that department. It's not uncommon for 20 of the beds to be occupied by boarded patients. Wow. So if you're seeing 150 patients per day, you're now having to see 150 patients per day in 10 beds rather than 30 beds. And what that means is a lot of those patients you're taking care of either in hallways or in triage areas or in waiting rooms or elsewhere. And at the same time, you're still taking care of the patients who were there yesterday and the day before because they're still boarding. So you can imagine the effects that that can have on quality of care that we deliver, patient safety, and it really, really takes a toll on nurses and ED staff. So on top of all the stressors that we've had with the pandemic and COVID, Oh, and by the way, we're still doing this behind N95 masks and shields and gowns. So the working conditions for emergency providers right now is very challenging. The worst it's ever been. And it's not as if the hospitalists and intensivists are not doing anything and they can be down in the emergency department helping because they're full and that's why you're boarding. So they're super busy as well. That's exactly right. And they've been very collaborative in just about every single case. But like you said, they're still taking care of every patient who's filling all those beds. Now they're coming down and helping us take care of the complex patients in the ED as well. So they're really being stretched uh, too. But it goes on from there. Most of our hospitals are tertiary, quaternary referral centers in the urban areas. But a lot of the smaller hospitals in the surrounding communities, in the suburbs and beyond, They don't have the resources to take care of complex patients. So typically, if a patient is seen in one of our emergency departments in a smaller city, they may be resuscitated in the ED and then flown or transferred by via ambulance to one of the larger hospitals. But when they're full, where do they go? They stay in that small town emergency department. And sometimes those hospitals don't have intensivists and they don't have cardiologists and they don't have GI consultants who can help. And we staff those ERs as well. We're being asked to care for patients for a much longer arc of their illness compared to traditional emergency medicine. You are critical care specialists in these other facilities, right? I mean, there's nobody else but the ED docs taking care of all these folks. That's right. They've been very collaborative. So they're helping us provide telehealth coverage for intensivists but they're already taking care of all the patients in their hospitals and their ICUs. So everybody's being stretched. We appreciate their help and they're superb, but it's still very challenging. So those are the current conditions. 
Patty. <laughs> it's helped us in certain ways. Reflecting back on where we started this conversation, which was the closure of one of our hospitals that led us to be overstaffed by 10 or 12 FTEs. And so the first quarter of last year, we were perseverating on what we can do to avoid layoffs, to make sure we're still honoring the outstanding job offers that we had for people who are going to be joining us. And we're able to maneuver through all this without laying anybody off, without rescinding any offers. And that was really very closely aligned with our commitment to ourselves and to our employees to really look after one another. And so we were able to do that. What's been most surprising is how quickly we have now swung back in the other direction to feeling overworked, <laughs> burned out, and struggling with all these challenges that we're talking about here. Yeah. I bet you're pretty thrilled that you didn't figure out you know, a way to rescind some offers and lay off a few people because it seems like you almost immediately needed them. That's right. And in fact, we didn't think we were going to hire anybody for another two or three years. And uh, we've just completed recruiting for another seven or eight doctors to start the summer. So wow. we're busy hiring and uh, <laughs> looking at interested parties. So yeah. How's the mood of those incoming emergency medicine physicians? It must be a little bit daunting, right? With all the press about the dire straits that emergency medicine is in. Yeah. Great question. Uh, medical students and residents have had a very different training experience than, than you or I had. Some of them have done the majority of their residency behind masks or with all their formal education being on Zoom, they are getting a different training experience. They tend to adapt quite well, but we have coworkers I've never really seen their face. <laughs> really? Really? Yeah. I mean, I have because I interview them, but a lot of our colleagues, they're working alongside them. And when they finally see them, oh, I had no idea you had a mustache, for example. <laughs> And that's is really eye opening to think actually about medical students that have done almost all of their work online and residents getting that training under the burden of all the the masks and gowns. That's right. Yeah, yeah. A lot of medical students had several months in a row where they just wouldn't go in for various rotations, and they're not allowed oftentimes to take care of COVID patients, for example. So they're getting their training on a narrower uh, pathway than. Mm -hmm what has traditionally been the case. I suppose in the, in the next few years, we'll come up with more strategies for how to train medical students in that environment. But it, it really does seem like a deficit for them, like a loss that they haven't had the kind of exposure that most medical students have. That's right. Yeah. So we talked about the impact of COVID. It sounds like has been bizarre from the get-go at first leading to really reduced emergency room volumes. And then now you're seeing patients in hallways and on gurneys in the aisles. And we talked about the hospital that closed and you were in a situation of being worried about compromising your values and having to lay off people after decades, really of having the kind of organization that prized the physician work life and taking care of each other. Before we circle back a little bit more to talking about your culture there, the other big crisis was the death of George Floyd. And I know it had a huge impact on the neighborhood and the folks in the department. So uh, any updates in that regard? Yeah. George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. It was just a mile down the road from the hospital where I primarily work, Abbott Northwestern in Minneapolis. The death of George Floyd and all the sequela has really affected our city and our community and our patients in significant ways. It has brought into a sharp focus racial divides. There's a lot more awareness of our history of unequal delivery of care based upon background. I have some colleagues in our group who are doing some research on the topic, looking at implicit bias and looking for examples in which emergency providers and staff are purposely or inadvertently delivering disparate care based upon race. So examples are how quickly do patients move from the waiting room? How quickly are they roomed from the waiting room to a bed in the emergency department? How often are patients admitted for chest pain versus discharged and told this is non-cardiac etiology based upon race. How often do we discharge patients with pain medications? Are there differences based upon race? And we don't have answers, but there's already some prevailing research uh, on those topics. And we're taking a, a closer look at that. 
our mission is to provide outstanding care for all patients. We want to be very attentive to any barriers which would affect that. Yeah. Thanks for that update. One of the reasons for me hunting you down and talking with you a year ago was the remarkable culture at ECC. And I wonder if you could talk about that and maybe describe the makeup of the organization now and the values that are underpinning the organization and what the culture is like now. Yeah. Well, our group is a physician-owned, physician-run, democratic group, and we're democratic to a fault. And what I mean by that is really just about all members of our group are owners and partners of the organization, and we're all on equal playing field. But there's almost no examples of seniority. We do have elected leaders to fulfill my role as the president of the group and medical director roles in various committees and whatnot. But in terms of kind of day-to-day, we really have an equal voice. Decisions that we make, particularly the most important decisions, are made collaboratively, democratically, where everybody has an equal vote. We are really strong believers in the power of group wisdom, as opposed to a leader charting the course and saying, this is the way we're going to do it. We really believe that even experienced leaders can make some really bad decisions or have really bad ideas. We've got a lot of smart people in the room and we're able to tap into that collective knowledge to help shape our strategy and our decisions. Now, did you call it collective wisdom? I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Our group has had opportunities to grow in the past. We've had invitations from hospitals where we could take on a new hospital, a new contract and have significant increase in our size and our breadth. When we face those opportunities or challenges, we have significant diversity of opinion. And the way we tackle those opportunities is we sit together in a room and whoever's leading the charge will lay the facts out on the table. And our approach is to then sit back and ask people to step up and opine in a collaborative fashion. When physicians first join our group, there's a run-up to joining the partnership. And during the first year or so, their primary job is to see patients and get their bearings clinically. But shortly thereafter, even our non-partners are invited to participate in our partnership meetings and to start engaging in the dialogue. They participate as an equal partner all the way up until the vote. They aren't able to vote until they're actually partners, but there's a whole bunch of professional development and inculcation that's occurring during those years. And we look at that as really, really important because these are going to be the people who are going to be leading the group five, 10 years down the road. So they are sitting side by side with people who've been partners in our group for 20 years and participating in the discussion. And the temperature in the room can get heated, but generally... We try to avoid banging our shoes on the table and we try to be good listeners. And by and large, we succeed with that. But every time we have a decision to be made, after the discussion is over, a vote is cast and everybody is expected to vote and the the majority gets their way. Furthermore, if I have a great idea, I think it's the best thing since baked bread. No, excuse me, best thing since sliced bread. And the group decides to go a different direction. The expectation of me is to go along with that and to not say, I told you so when things don't go well. We do have the capacity to revisit decisions and we always like to tinker. ER doctors are really good at trying to fix problems and sometimes we over tinker. This is our lifeblood uh, of our culture. This is really important. It's our capacity to take ownership of where we want to be going and how we want to progress into the future. I've probably got a hundred questions there, but first of all, I want to say, I like your improvement on the little metaphor, best thing since baked bread. And then it's a democratic process, which I think in most situations, the fact that everybody votes on the leader would be enough to you know, give it the stamp of a democratic process, but you take it way beyond that. So that's what you mean by to a fault. And everybody continues to be voting basically on issue after issue. That's right. And democracy is messy. We always joke that you need DVT prophylaxis before our meetings. We get together every month and they can be four-hour meetings, but we look forward to it. 
Wow. So we've been trying to do this on Zoom and it's been a major challenge. And some people can still stay engaged, but it's really hard when you're sitting at home and staring at a screen. Mm -hmm. We've been able to make our way through it, but that's just another one of the elements of fallout from the pandemic. Yeah. Really fascinating. I love what you said, actually, that little throwaway line of you really enjoy the meetings and there's a reason you get stuff done. There's real decisions being made. And so who wants to miss that meeting? Of course, it would degrade in the Zoom environment, but that says a lot about the meaningfulness of your meetings. Absolutely. In fact, when we recruit new doctors, we've already gone through all these filters. We know that they're going to be clinically quite good. We need to verify that. But really what's on my mind when I'm interviewing new doctors and meeting them and getting to know them is imagining them sitting next to me in a business meeting and trying to determine, can they engage in a productive manner within our structure and within our ecosystem? And so we talk extensively about that in job interviews. I think it differentiates us in their minds from a lot of other groups, but it's not a good fit for everybody. Some people want to show up for work and they don't want to have to be bothered with running the show. I can appreciate that because it does take a lot of energy and a lot of time. Much better to get that figured out on the front end as they're coming in rather than trying to introduce that engagement and citizenship after the ship has already sailed. Yeah. That's fantastic. So Topher, could you talk more about the culture and what underpins the culture and the success? Yeah. One of the most important features uh, within our organization is that democracy that we've been talking about. When somebody's a partner in a group, everything is equal. And why is that important? Well, it's important because collectively, all of us together need to be viewing the landscape from a similar setting. If you have too many layers of seniority, it tends to create too many perspectives that can take away our ability to try to resolve the issues or achieve things without bringing in individual interests. We all know what we're trying to achieve as a group. It allows us to really collaborate much more effectively. So let's say we're talking about things that may affect people in various age ranges or where individuals could be affected differently. If people are coming from different levels of seniority, it could really start to create divisiveness or make it more difficult for us to make the best decision for the department overall or for the organization overall. I think we see it so much in organizations where physician groups are seduced by maybe a private equity group and the partners make the decision and leave a bunch of folks who are not yet partners or perhaps didn't sign on for the partnership track and leave them holding the bag. The partners get a big buyout and they disappear and deep six, the whole physician organization. Yeah, that's a great example. We've seen that happen many times, haven't we? Mm -hmm. It seems like what you're describing is the difference between a bureaucracy where you get all those layers and your more direct democracy where you keep it flat and, you know, the leaders chosen from within the group, but everybody continues to have a voice. You know, I just finished up an interview with Elfie Cohn, who wrote Punished by Rewards, and he talks about the damaging effects of incentives on uh, organizations and on individuals and, and really how extrinsic incentives squash intrinsic motivation. Basically, you end up being interested in the reward and no longer terribly interested in the work itself. And it makes me curious in your organization, do you have incentives? Don't have incentives? What does that look like? And what are some of the other elements do you think that keep people in your organization? Yeah. Well, very interesting reference because he's talking about the exact same thing that you and I are talking about here. If there are individualized interests that are motivating people differently within the same organization, that can be a distraction. So we, as an organization, we don't have, I mean, there's a little bit of compensation that's related to productivity and whatnot, but it's a small part and it's not enough to be a motivating factor. The incentives that we do have are incentives that would benefit the entire group. So for example, with the health insurance companies with which we contract or the hospitals where we work, we have incentive contracts so that there are goals 
for the hospital, for example, that they want to achieve. And so we go about focusing on those goals for the year collectively. And if we achieve them, those benefits trickle back to all of us as a group, not as an individual. So everybody is rowing the boat in the same direction. There's no motivation to go it on your own, for example. And that really contributes to the collective health uh, of our organization. And once again, it allows people, when we're in our business meetings and we're making decisions, it allows us to all you know, have trust of one another that we're all there trying to accomplish the same goals and the same tasks. It just strikes me that your organization is such a great example of physician leadership and why it's important to have the people who have the most expertise in the field running the organization. And can you comment on that? Are you a believer? Yeah, definitely a believer. It's not to say that all healthcare leaders need to be physicians, but in our specialty, we're natural fixers. We like tackling problems and We spent our careers on the floor in the emergency department in these very complex operational environments. And the doctors and the nurses there, we have a perspective that nobody else has. You don't get that perspective from going to business school. You don't get that perspective from meetings. You get it from living and working in those environments. That's really the backbone of why this is so important. Now, that being said, we work in a hospital. There are many different cohorts and groups, and you can't work with blinders on emergency medicine. It's just one department in a hospital, and the hospital is just one hospital in the community. You really have to be very, very mindful of the needs of others and of the big picture. We can't just be docs calling the shots. But if you have the right docs who have the right mindset and are able to collaborate with the non-physicians and the administrators, and you have administrators who buy into that and have noted the value that we as physicians can bring as leaders, then that's a winning combination. And that has really been the primary driver of our growth and the primary reason for our stability. And we've been able to demonstrate value and demonstrate a commitment to the hospitals for a long, long time. As I recall, that was actually one of the founding principles, right? That's right. Well, the first principle is that patient care comes first. So outstanding care for any patient at any time. Any decision that we make needs to put patient care first. We will never make a decision that negatively affects patient care or limits care. Number two in our values is that we value the relationships with the hospitals and the healthcare systems where we work and where we serve. And if we work together with those groups, we'll all be more successful. It's a sincere belief for us. It's not just a sunshine that we blow when we're meeting with them. But every time I meet with a healthcare executive, particularly if it's for the first time, I tell them that. I say, this is a value of our organization. And with that, what are your priorities? What can we help you with right now? I don't know what it's like when they meet with other groups, but the feedback we get is that they appreciate that and that it goes a long way in determining who they come back to when they need help or when they have opportunities. So this this has been beneficial, I think, both ways, both for us and for the hospitals. And then your third principle. Our third principle is that we as doctors and we as PAs, all the providers in our group, we can deliver the best care if we are very well supported. We understand how hard a career in emergency medicine is. We have the worst burnout rates as a specialty compared to all other specialties. You cannot survive a career in emergency medicine if you are not well supported. The hours are terrible. We work days, evenings, nights, weekends, holidays. We never close the doors of an emergency department. We used to have, we could go and divert and so we could turn ambulances away. But in our community, in the Twin Cities, we can't go and divert anymore. So we never close the doors. And that's pretty unique in the hospital and medical world. Yeah. I'm not sure of too many other specialties that can <laughs> don't have the ability to close the doors at any time. So you can imagine, and, and people from all walks of life come with all walks of problems, and there's just not much control in terms of what your next patient is going to be, what they're going to be presenting with. And so all of these make it very challenging to survive the marathon career that we have. So how do you do it? Well, we believe that we need to have 
control over our schedules. We think that you have to work much less than most people work. We we really promote breadth in our lives. We want to have plenty of time with family and friends and hobbies and extraclinical professional endeavors, time to rest, time to blow off steam. And when you do come to work, we want you to be rested and eager to go to work. But you can't do that if you're working 40 hours per week as an ER doc. You just can't do it. You need to be working closer to 20 hours per week. Really? So we actively, actively promote our doctors to work less than they think they should. Earlier in career, people need to make money. There's debts, there's the first house or whatever their financial needs are. But so they, they tend to work a little bit harder during the first couple of years, but we actively promote people to reduce their hours. We think they're better doctors and we think they're happier people and better contributors to our group if they work significantly less than they think they should. Yeah. And it sounds like that is right around the 20 hours a week on average. Is that right? That's probably a little low. In that ballpark? Realistically, people work 20 to 30 hours per week on average. Okay. And then don't have any mandate about a full-time schedule or anything like that. Is that right? Definitely no mandate for a full-time schedule. You know, a lot of the shifts in the ERs are off hours, overnights, weekends, evenings. So we have our policy is that everybody has a responsibility for those. Even if your first day or your last day with our group, you still have the same level of responsibility for the more onerous shifts. But what we do is we financially incentivize people. We use a carrot in the shape of money to attract people to nights and weekends and shifts that are less attractive. Mm -hmm. And that works great because um, what we find is some people are naturally attracted more towards working nights or weekends or holidays or or things that may not be attractive to other people. So we have night hawks and we have weekend hawks. We have people who like to work Christmas and that works quite well. But if we ever get to a situation where we have a shift that everybody hates, do you know what we do? We pull out the money carrot and (laughs) we dangle it there and we say, Okay, let's pay more for the shift. And quickly, like flies, a few people are attracted to it. And that is very, very effective. Yeah. It's putting a premium on the on the toughest, least desirable shifts. It so that it kind of equalizes them with the rest of the shifts. That makes sense to me. That sounds like a good use of incentives if it qualifies as an incentive. Yeah. And each individual understands that if we're raising the money to pay for this shift we're taking it away from what we pay for the more attractive shifts and everybody gets to vote on that. There's nobody else deciding how much we're paying for the shifts, except we, the doctors. Okay. We have to pause on that because that's fascinating. So the regular shifts or the more desirable shifts, the pay goes down and everybody votes on this. So when I talked with Alfie Cohn, who wrote, you know, punished by rewards, he talked about how really the basis of what an incentive is, is control by somebody who's more powerful than you are. It's a way of causing people, bullying people. That's not exactly the right word, but it's, it's a way of manipulating people into doing something that they don't necessarily want to do. And here you don't have anybody that's in a position of power that is dangling a carrot or a threat. You basically have everybody making a decision together about what the rates are going to be for these shifts. Yes. Really fascinating. We'll have to see what Alfie says about that. It wouldn't fit into that neat category of the incentives and rewards that degrade interest in the activity that you're incentivizing. There's nobody in control who is squashing your autonomy, getting you to make this decision or to take this action. Unless you're part of that decision-making body and you're voting against that. And so there is that as a, as a democracy, but there's discussion, there's dialogue, and there's at least knowledge in the fact that you, you did have an equal vote and you had an opportunity to speak up. Yeah. I'll see if I can get him to weigh in on that. I love that follow on from the other conversation. I was going to ask you, what's the mood like and what's the culture look like right now in ECC? Well, we're bruised. And because of all the current conditions, the the boarding has been very difficult to tolerate. And, And there's so many factors 
there's the high volumes. A lot of the patients who are in the ICU and on the ventilators with COVID, they may stay in the hospital or on a ventilator for weeks. And so it's hard to get patients out of the hospital. The lengths of stay in ICUs and on ventilators is much longer for COVID patients than typical patients. The labor markets are terrible in virtually every industry. And in hospitals, you see this with very severe nursing shortages, but also there are shortages of techs and nutritionists and pharmacists and uh, respiratory therapists, and the list goes on and on. We even face that with scribes. For the first time ever, we, we were one of the first scribe groups in the country, and we used to have an abundance of applicants, and we have approximately 200 scribes who work for our group. And for the first time ever over, this, over the past six months, we can't hire enough scribes. And so we're starting to work shifts without a scribe or sharing a scribe. Wow. And poor doctors, right? They don't have a scribe for every shift, <laughs> but it is an adjustment. And it was kind of hardwired into how we work. And so all these have, are contributing to the stressors. We're hopeful that there's light at the end of the tunnel, but throughout the pandemic, there have been several lights at the end of the tunnel and suddenly it's Delta and then it's Omicron and then it's whatever's next. So it's tough to maintain optimism, but the lessons that we are learning from this, we need to continue to invest in as, as an organization into the infrastructure of our organization. We need to be damn sure that everybody's getting their paycheck on time to make sure that our credentialers are doing everything they can to limit the extraneous paperwork and extraneous requirements non-clinical requirements for our docs. And we need to be there supporting our docs and our APPs every step along the way. And so that's what we're doing. We're focusing on, you know, doubling down on how we support ourselves so that we can then make it through our careers and be there for the patients. There are chapters in which our organization is more focused on what's next, new opportunities. And this is not the time for us to be focusing on that. We need to be really zeroed in on what's important. For me, I think that's wellness. You know, we talk about wellness and it can mean different things for different people. But for me, wellness means looking after the well-being of our group. And it's all the way down to those very basic fundamental uh, elements that help people feel supported during their jobs. I've done some railing against referring to evening yoga class or a meditation workshop over lunch as wellness. So now I'm curious what your take is. What is wellness to your group? Well, I agree with you. Nobody needs a popcorn social. That's not wellness, <laughs> but it's a topic that's so vast. Sometimes it's intimidating. It's like world peace. How can you make a dent and how can you address that without feeling overwhelmed? It, it, and it means different things for different people. For some people, it might mean having a social outing or having collective athletic opportunity, you know, going for a group run or, or whatnot. Uh, for other people, it might mean having access to mental health or a psychiatrist or resources. For others, it might mean getting together as a group of you know, physicians who are struggling and getting together in small sessions and talking about their problem. And for others, it might mean just trying to work less and uh, being able to kind of dial back on the number of shifts they're working. So what might be very meaningful and important for one person may not hold water with the other person, but there are other things that would be meaningful to that person. So you really need to have, really have your eyes pretty wide open when you're talking about wellness. So the way we address it is, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, we really, really focus on supporting our docs and our APPs. That's one of our core values. That is wellness. And there's a million different ways you can do it. I mean, we have, we staff up more than a lot of other ER groups, such that we have more providers per hour than most ERs with similar volumes. Yes. So that you don't have to see 2.4 patients per hour, you see 1.6 patients per hour. You have overlap in your shifts. So there are resources there so that when, as you get towards the end of your shift, your replacement is coming an hour before the end of your shift and you get out on time. So those are some basic things. And those are hardwired into how we've always done it. But the list goes on and on. 
So in addition to some of these hardwired features, we also have wellness committees who are elected by their peers. And then they go out and they canvas and they ask people on the floor and through surveys, through dialogue, what do you need? What's important to you? And they coalesce those and they bring ideas forward. And once again, not everything is going to resonate with everybody, but that's not the goal. The goal is to have things that resonate with some people be available and things that resonate with other people be available to have the total smorgasbord of wellness so that people can have access to things that they need as an individual. What's on each end of the smorgasbord? Can you give me kind of a, the widest sampling? <laughs> Mental health resources is the most serious one. So we have that in collaboration with our hospital. We have peer support groups where people who are struggling get together with other people who are struggling. And sometimes those are proctored by professionals, or sometimes it's just the professionals getting together. I think of that as probably the most critical because our health and safety as physicians and caregivers is difficult as it's ever been. Suicides amongst physicians are not insignificant. So I think those are the most important ones. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. We don't have popcorn socials, but there are certain things we do that might be just purely social based. But I think that's really critical too, for some people. That's how some people are energized by getting together with their coworkers outside of work and having a beer together. Absolutely. Can you talk about your turnover rate? Talk about your physician and nursing turnover rate in the ED. We have very little turnover. People generally come to our group and spend their entire career with us. The exceptions are generally when there's families moving to other parts of the country for one reason or another. We have literally zero turnover in terms of people leaving our group and going to join our competitors or other hospitals or groups in town. It never happens. In fact, it has never happened. It has never happened. That's it has never happened. That is uh that that's a statistic, Topher. Whoa. Right. Yeah. And and how does it, it look? It will with... happen. So I don't want to, you know, I'll knock on wood a little right, bit. Right. But it hasn't. <laughs> it hasn't yet. Right. In 30 years. And, uh, and how about the nursing staff? That's just devastating across the country. And I, I'm wondering how that turnover is doing. Yeah. I, I mean, nurses are stretched thin and they need to be supported more than ever. The politics happening around COVID in our society, oftentimes they face abuse from patients about people who are denying that COVID is real. This is to our nurses who have been taking care of COVID patient after COVID patient for almost two years now. So turnover has been challenging, but most of them stick around. Most of them have made a, a very meaningful commitment to their hospitals and their communities. And it's tough when people do leave because it makes it harder for the ones who have really kind of doubled down on that commitment. So every time someone leaves, it kind of raises the stakes for everybody who's chosen to stay. Yeah. It's so tough. Yeah. You know, you said earlier that you see the importance of having physician leadership and having your organization be physician owned and run, and that there's things that physicians know that you don't learn in business school. And I wonder if you could talk about why you think the things that physicians know are important in running a business. Well, once again, our prime directive is to deliver great care. And so really that is the core of what we do. Maybe it's not the core of our business, but it is the cornerstone of why we're here. And so much of emergency medicine, as I've mentioned before, is really on managing the flow of patients. The doors never close. They're always open. So we have to be prepared to care for everybody as they come. We're the ones who are utilizing the resources there. We're using the tools to care for the patients and then identify the correct dispositions for the patients. We're the only ones who can really expedite care and judiciously use those resources. It's hard to imagine how people who aren't involved in the day-to-day -day allocation of care, how they can have greater insight as to where these solutions might be or how to improve the efficiencies. In terms of running a business in healthcare, particularly in our specialty, we only provide the professional care. We're the doctors and the ABBs. We don't employ the nurses. We don't employ the techs. And so our business model is straightforward. We contract with health insurance companies and we provide the care and then we code the charts and, and we collect the money and then we pay ourselves to do the work. 
there's a little bit more to it than that, but it's not it's not too complicated compared to a lot of other kind of production based companies where you're creating widgets or commodities. Mm-hmm. It's really a service that we're providing. And so there isn't really too much space for quote unquote business people to get involved. There's not much added value. The only time it's going to add value is if you're having a structure in which they're trying to turn it into a for-profit model. And generally that would be for investors or people who aren't actually providing the care. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Why? Why are you trying to avoid that? Well, we're, we're the experts. We're providing the care. There's no interest for us to have people investing in trying to carve off the top of our profits. What, what benefit are they providing? They're not helping the patients. They're not helping us be better doctors. They're not making better decisions on how to operate our emergency departments. They, they provide no value. They're just there to take. I do believe that is a quote. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, That would be the theme right there. Making some enemies with that one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will turn the page. Topher, what is this uh, phase of your life about? What have you been learning about yourself? Personally? Yes. I've got my first kid off in college and my second kid is lined up. And it's interesting as you go through your career in balance with your non-career life, you know, I think of medical school and residency and early career and early involvement in leadership and raising my kids and everything that goes there. It's been one long residency. (laughs) (laughs) And suddenly we're entering a chapter in which there's a lot more freedom and a lot more independence. And it's really been a great satisfier. I have the time to breathe and think and let things roll in my mind with fewer distractions and to pursue other interests and to help kind of create that balance that I think is really vital. And I try to, I try to guide people who are newer out of training. I try to help provide that perspective. And I had people ahead of me who provided that perspective for me when I was 15 years younger. I think it's so vital. I think everybody needs that. I think the worst thing that we can do in our career is to overwork. You're going to have plenty of time to work and it becomes less and less fulfilling if you're not you know, coming up for air and taking care of yourself. I can remember when we talked the last time you said you just really wanted to have the physicians show up for their, well, their shift nirvana, but show up for their shifts, really happy to be there, really happy to be taking care of patients. Yeah. Yeah. And it's harder. It's harder than it used to be uh, for them to do that. Lots of our doctors are in relationships where they're both physicians and they have young kids. I was raised by a doctor and that was not his life. My mom stayed at home and she worked as well, but expectations within our society have made things so much more challenging to, to achieve that balance. And even in our downtime, we're connected to our phones and we're connected to TikTok and whatever else distraction. It's hard to find uh, time for tranquility, but we need it. Tranquility. Did you say TikTok? Are you on TikTok? <laughs> I'm not. No, <laughs> no, you're not. I know about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that rolled right off your tongue. That was pretty good. <laughs> so you talked about 15 years ago, other physicians were showing you the importance of balance. And can you think of uh, any kind of seminal moment where you got the message? That's a good question. I don't know if I can identify a seminal moment, but I can identify a seminal individual who's been a great role model for me. Okay. Really a mentor for me, Sam. And Sam was a leader and he's 10 to 15 years older than me, but has been a terrific role model for me throughout my career. In fact, when I stepped into the leadership role in our group, he was a vice president in the group. And even though he'd been around forever and was infinitely wiser than me, he was always there as this great role model and and humble, but really demonstrated how to achieve balance in life and how to really remember what's important and what isn't important. Minneapolis has lakes everywhere. And Sam and I continue to take walks around the lake and reflect on what we've been through. And he always likes to hear updates on the current challenges and opportunities. 
he's been a great role model for me. And hopefully everybody has, has a Sam in their life. And certainly that's one of my goals is to try to be a Sam for other people. I love that. It sounds like in a way he really was helping show you how to be a physician. Yeah. And a professional and a person and a dad and a friend. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I wonder if you've got a perspective or an opinion on what is really at the root of all the burnout in medicine. Yeah. Medicine is 24 seven. The expectations are that we provide the same level of care in the middle of the night and on weekends that we do during the, the work week. I think hospitalists and emergency groups are starting to get it right because they have identified shift work as a better model compared to call. And I think general surgeons are starting to, to adopt that. And I think OBGYN groups are starting to adopt that as well. And I think that's a direction that can really help alleviate some of those pressures. Sometimes I, I don't really have a great understanding of what drives burnout for everybody. It's a hard question to solve. People who are burnt out, I think oftentimes don't really understand maybe what's the driving force. So if I had a good answer for you, maybe I could be a better <laughs> leader. I think that you actually have headed it off at the pass. You have a value that physicians are going to be happy to show up to work and you have equated that with supporting the heck out of them. And that's not going on out there. We've got physicians that are doing two hours of EHR data input while they're sitting on the end of their kid's bed at night. You mentioned widgets as if it was a different kind of company earlier, but I, I'm afraid that in a lot of organizations, the physicians really have become the widgets. And, and I think it's been devastating. Yeah. Yeah. Having technology at home so that you can finish charts at home. It sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah. Who thought that was a good idea? Yeah. <laughs> Always available. Always answer your phone. Always uh, respond to your emails and be available. There's no time for what we were talking about earlier. There's no time to separate yourself from that part of your life. Well, Dr. Obitz, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast again. And it's just been fantastic catching up with you. Hattie, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate what you're doing for physicians in the community. And it's really been a, a treat and an honor. Thank you. Well, Dr. Obitz is an inspiring leader. Here's a request for my listeners. Do healthcare in America a little favor, and me too, and send this episode to people who sit on the board of directors of your healthcare institution or your community hospital. Better yet, send them my newsletter, which has links to this episode and lots of extra scintillating information. Dr. Obitz is one of the many physician CEOs who helps to create an outstanding organizational culture because of his commitment to patients. He calls it the prime directive. He's not in a leadership role to make bank or to get an even bigger leadership role or a supersized bonus. It might not be completely sufficient, but I do think physician leadership is absolutely necessary in order to bring the right priorities and the right skill sets into healthcare leadership in order to stop the madness. Okay, well, I did ask Alfie Cohen, my previous guest, whether paying more for night shifts qualifies as an incentive. And he said, quote, I don't object to compensating people more for doing more work or more difficult work. We run into problems when people are paid more for what someone with more power decides is higher quality work, i.e. pay for performance, close quote. And he had several other fascinating opinions, including thoughts about voting, which he calls adversarial majoritarianism, which is prized mainly because it doesn't take very long. And he said real democracy is rare and invariably must involve debate and consensus. I have to admit what he describes as real democracy sounds a lot like what the fine physician partners at ECC do. They debate and discuss until the cows come home so that all opinions are heard but then they do vote. Once again, big thanks to Dr. Topher Obitz and Alfie Cohn and to you for all of your care and caring. Thanks for listening to the Licensed to Lead podcast. Be sure to visit licensedtoleadpodcast.com to join the conversation, access the show notes and sign up for our newsletter. Leave us a message with your provocative question or your thoughtful comments. You might inspire a future episode of the Licensed to Lead podcast. Thanks so much, everyone.